Good morning. <laughs> cool. So the scripture is in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. Okay. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Thank you, Tim. Looking forward to the picnic today. That's always a good time and uh, always a good thing to be able to do because you can go buy any food you want. And it's the one time that uh, you have a good excuse for fast food so you can get to the picnic and be able to play and just be able to talk to lots of other people. I find the talking is more important now than the playing of volleyball and stuff like that. So, But I hope you're planning on coming. That's always a good time to be able to do that. I was having trouble with my microphone, Jack. It's like somebody had tiny ears when they... <laughs> if you weren't here before, you don't understand. <laughs> We're going to be talking about the cross and about what that really means for us in the next couple of weeks. So today's kind of an introduction with the, the way the, that Paul talks about it. I want to come from his point of view and from something after the Gospels, how did the early church understand this cross? Because I think sometimes it's a little bit confusing for us today and trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to say. Um, and of course, when you start the passage with Christ didn't send for me to baptize, and you're like, wait a second, what's the end going to be? Well, the end's going to be talking about baptism, but uh, okay, just stay with me, all right? Because when you look at the cross of Christ, sometimes we get confused about the message. And when he looks at this and he says, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And he wants the cross of Christ to have its full power. Well, what he's been doing with all of this, the context of this passage is he's talking to a church that has huge division in it. It has all kinds of issues in it. And if you go through the book of Corinthians, there's one problem after another. It's one of those churches where it seems like nothing fit together. Nothing is working together. I mean, they're all there. They're all doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they don't like each other. And they keep arguing with each other. And I don't know if you've ever been part of a church like that, but the main life of church is not about the fact that we all showed up and we all sat in pews and we all took communion and we all went home. It's about that interaction between people that happen once we get here. And it's about those relationships and it's about that understanding because the power of the cross is the fact that it's happened for all of us. And it draws all of us together into this. And so when you look at the fact that, you know, all of this was them deciding, well, I'm this way and you're that way and I don't like you for this. In fact, they had come down to where they had picked preachers. And one person said, well, Paul baptized me, so I'm better than you. And another one said, well, Apollos baptized me, so I'm better than you. And they were arguing over this and he said, He's pretty frustrated by this point. It's only chapter one. And so he says, I wasn't sent there to baptize. And it's in that context that the statement is made. I wasn't sent there to be able to promote disunity. I wasn't sent there so that things would not work. I wasn't sent there so that you guys could argue over this. Because the real message is about the power of the cross. And that's what's most important. The gospel is the way to put the power of the cross into our life. And when we preach the power of the gospel, we come out at the point of baptism. But it's understanding what that baptism is about. 
because it's pretty empty without the cross. And that's what makes all the difference. When we die to ourselves, when we are buried with Christ in baptism, it makes that connection point with his grace. It makes that connection point with his blood. It's not just the fact that he did it. It's the fact that now we connect with him. And so he might have done that, but we have no connection. We might think, oh, well, I kind of believe it, but until you're willing to say, no, I want him in my life and I'm willing to make this connection that puts the grace of God there, we don't quite understand. And so as he talks about this, he says, some people don't get it. The word of the cross seems like foolishness because it doesn't mean anything to them. They don't understand. They're not being saved. It's not what their life is like. It's not anything related to their experience because after all, it does seem kind of strange that the plot of the whole thing is the fact that we have this great tremendous God and he's come to be able to make this great life for us and the way he is going to save us is by death of his son. Really? And then there's something about we have to commit to him and go to church for the rest of our life. And they really don't understand the process at all or what it makes sense because that story doesn't fit any of the other hero stories in their life. What kind of movies do you like? Well, I like the ones where, okay, there is a problem. You know, there's got to be a problem, some kind of issue, something that doesn't go right and is going wrong. And then somebody's got to come in and they struggle and they fight and they do all this kind of stuff. But they always have this great power. You know, come in to save the day. And they come in with this great power and they finally win over their enemies. They look like they weren't going to be able to win, but they know karate and jujitsu and all these moves that they can slice and chop and throw enemies every which way. And finally they win because of their great skill and strength and might and power and everybody lives happily ever after. Yeah, right. My life doesn't work like that. I don't know if your life works like that, but I like to watch that to pretend that that's how it would happen. I could be the guy with the great power. I could know people who are the guy with the great power at this stage of life. And that still doesn't happen. And it's not the way I see anyone winning. It works more like the cross when we surrender and find the greater power in life, then we are able to realize what goes on. The cross seems like foolishness to them. We think we're just fine. We'll be fine on our own. I can do it. Just leave me alone. There's no problems in the world right now. I can survive on my own. I can do whatever I want to do and we don't really know anything about being alive except for I'm alive and my first job is to survive the best way that I can and so I will be good at survival. Okay, really? And that's it? And we don't even know how to live. We don't even understand what it's all about. So they don't understand how to do it and there are some things that we just don't need to know do you know how to melt snow? Well, that's probably not very practical here, is it? In some places, you need to know how to melt snow because that front walk is really dangerous and people die on that front walk if they're going to slip and fall. And it is a yearly occurrence where this is the greatest danger right outside of your house. And you better know how to get rid of ice. At least put sand on it, put something on it, put salt on it, and then it kills your grass. You got to do something to be able to get rid of this huge, and we don't care because that's why we live here, right? I will give you the one tip. The one thing we do have is frost and no ice scrapers. You can't buy an ice scraper down here. What would you ever need an ice scraper so? 
Growing up in Alaska, here's the one tip that I have for you today, which is practical. Don't say my sermons aren't practical. So when it frosts, you're going to have to remember this for a very, very long time. Here's the key that always worked. You have one instrument always with you, which will always work. Okay? Most of you don't know. It is very simple. This is the best ice scraper in the world because it's always in your back pocket. You hold it by the teeth, and you just use the back, and you just scrape all the ice off. See, now you know the next time you get frost that that's what will happen. Yeah, well, some people don't carry combs, Calvin, I'm sorry. Yeah. You can carry the comb and say, it's an ice scraper. Not sure you'll get away with that. So where were they when they decided that none of this made sense? Well, they were created. That's who I am. I'm alive. I exist. And that's all there is to it. They didn't really understand that there's more to it than that. The cross seems like foolishness because we don't understand because it does not have immediate gratification, because it isn't fun. There's nothing fun about a cross, and it gets in the way of our fun. And it asks for morality, and it asks for honesty, and it gets in the way of us doing the things that we want to do, which cause heartache. And it points out the fact that a lot of our mistakes are stupid and that we shouldn't do those things and we should live a better life than what we are living. But it's realizing that those things are mistakes and what those mistakes are. So I thought I'd give you a couple of examples if you're filling up your car and it looks like this. What's wrong with this picture? You have a serious problem unless your car's a diesel. Do not ever get the green handled pump. That is not the gas for you. And it is not a simple solution when you put it in. You cannot just ignore it and think it will go away and say, well, hope nobody saw that. I'll just get in and drive off. You probably won't get out of the parking lot before your car dies and you are not going anywhere. And it is so hard to be able to get rid of that issue. It was just a mistake. And if it's just a mistake, can't you say, give a reset and say, well, no, it doesn't matter. You realize when you make a little mistake, like getting the green handle pump instead of the other color, you don't drive anymore. You have to pull off the gas tank. You have to completely clean out the gas tank. You have to clean out the lines. You have to take out the fuel injectors and clean out the fuel injectors. And you probably don't know how to do that. So now you're talking somebody else to be able to do that. And they're talking a lot of money to be able to do that. So just that one simple mistake, it was just a green handle pump. And we want to say that about our sin. It was just a little mistake. I didn't mean it. Well, guess what? It has consequences that will not go away. It is not a simple fix, and you will not get away with it because it affects your life. It changes your life. It affects everything the way in which it happens. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, that's not going to be a good situation. And we come into these mistakes all the time. We do this. I mean, somewhere the boat launch did not go well. You should have put the plug in the bottom, or I don't know exactly what happened. And then my favorite, if you're trying to do construction, do not make this mistake and ask your friend to be a sawhorse. Uh, that, that will not end well. So let's talk a little bit about what Jesus did and about the way in which he did it. In Romans 5 and verse 6, it says, For while we were still weak, 
At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him, saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We read that, we've read that before, we've heard that before, and it doesn't really penetrate, does it? We don't quite understand because, after all, our mistake was just a little bitty. We didn't mean it. And it shouldn't have such lasting eternal consequences. What do you mean that it has lasting eternal consequences? It was just fun. That's all there was to it. But if you really look at the passage and realize what the passage is saying, he talks about where we are. And when you just highlight those words a little bit, while we were weak, we are ungodly, we are sinners, we are enemies. I thought it was just a little mistake. No, the mistake is because of your ungodliness, your weakness, the fact that sin is all over you and it makes you an enemy of God. It is not a simple fix to say, oh, well, why don't we just forget this one? It doesn't happen. But in that same passage, when you look at the things Jesus has done and the benefit that comes to us, it looks more like this. The fact that Christ died for us who are ungodly. The fact that God shows his love for us. The fact that we've been justified by his blood. The fact that we are reconciled to God. The fact that we, have sa we are saved from that wrath of God. The fact that we have the death of his son. And we're saved by his life. And we're also able to rejoice. That's a huge list, isn't it? Of what he's been able to do to overcome the first ones. All of the weakness that we have had and all of the things that have been there. And now he takes away our sin. He pays the price for our sin because of his love. And we are justified by his blood. I don't know if you've been at that place where you've had kids and you've loved them and they've done something wrong and you've had to spank them and you realize they're angry but you're the one in the room that loves them. More often we've been the child who uh, did something wrong, right? And you got spanked for it but you realize the only person in the room who loves you is the one who gave you the spanking. Does that relate with God to you? How do we get out of our mistake so that it doesn't exist anymore? You don't. You really don't. It will never go away and there is no simple fix. You just go through it. That's really the hard truth of it all is we live through our mistakes and we find someone who enables us to live through them because of his love for us and his compassion for us and his sacrifice for us. It allows us to take that mistake and to become someone so much better. Well, what's our response to all of this? This is found in Luke chapter 21. As Jesus talks to his disciples, he says, and he strictly charged and commanded them to tell no one saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? So Jesus is talking to his disciples and saying, I'm going to die. And of course, they don't 
quite understand this and they don't quite believe this because it doesn't make sense. Their sense of who a hero is is the conquering hero again who would come in and deliver them from the Romans. We all like that story. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not the story that works. It has never worked that way in your life. It works this way in your life when you realize you need the power of God. And when you accept the power of God, accepting that power of God means this humility and denying yourself, taking up your own place of death daily, your own cross saying, yes, I would die for him, and just deciding you're going to follow him and do what he says. And you're not going to be about your own life and your own rights and your own things that you've decided that you know how to do. Because that hasn't gotten you anywhere in your fight. You take up his cross. And so we surrender. Why don't we steal what God has? You know, usually if there's somebody who can pay for it, we can go and steal what he paid. Right? And then we could pay for it ourselves and... Yeah, that's stupid. Who would steal a cross? If you had the great hero, you would steal the money he was going to pay for you. If you had the great hero, you'd steal his power. And we have a cross. Really? Who's going to steal a cross? Because it doesn't mean anything, does it? It's just another death. Unless somebody did it intentionally out of love for you when they didn't need it. And said, I will give this to you. You can't steal it. You can't get away with it. You can't make it any better. You can just accept it. This is who God is. This is the wisdom of God. It's make what makes it precious. If we look at back at 1 Corinthians 1, the passage we were talking about, Paul then goes on to describe where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the foolishness, made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For God demands signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Who tells you the best way to live today? Do you watch all the TV ads that say, man, if I just had one of those, I'd have a great life? Do you watch all the billboards and the signs and the stores? Because they all have something you need in order to have a great life. It's going to be so good. It's going to be wonderful. I don't think the advertisers are really the answer for it all. The theory today is I'll do what I want and I can control my own destiny. Yeah, how's that worked? When we look at the world and we look around at all the people... Why have we not solved the problem of death? Maybe because we can't. But we haven't even solved the problem of injustice, or prejudice, or hatred. We haven't solved the problem of how to get together in a world so that we can all get along. We haven't created a world where we don't need lawsuits anymore because everybody's so nice to each other. Somehow we've created more of a demand for lawyers, for courts, for difficulties, for escape. And God says, we're going to save people through crazy preaching. That's what he says. He says, the Jews want signs. They want the power. Let's get the big miracle. We'll all walk across the dry land from the Red Sea or the Atlantic Ocean or somewhere. It's not going to do it. The Greeks want wisdom. Let me logic this out. I'll understand how to do it when I can. And there is no logic to a cross. There is no logic to someone dying. 
We come up with weak excuses like, well, I think God wanted them. No, he didn't. Come on. We're just trying to make ourselves feel better. We write stories about that great love that someone would give up their life for. We don't live those stories. Those are the movies. Those are the books. And we wish someone would do it for us. And somebody has. We just need to recognize it. We need to see it. We need to understand. Because that's what makes all the difference. The power of the cross is the blood of Christ. And any of our other solutions, just put them to the test. All of our other solutions, anything else that you could come up with, wait a thousand years on it. Then will it make a difference? Will it make life better then? What investment can you make right now that will give great returns in a thousand years? I mean, you ought to have one pile of interest, shouldn't you? Is there anyone who's invested for a thousand years? What kind of rights can you get that would affect you in a thousand years? What kind of custom could you have? What kind of cause could you back in a thousand years? What kind of riches could you amass that would mean anything in a thousand years? What kind of building could you set up? What kind of nation could you make in a thousand years? It is all gone. There are no nations in a thousand years. I mean, they go up, they come down, they go back down, they go up, they go... There is nothing in a thousand years except Jesus Christ. And for 2,000 years, he's made all the difference. And we look at the church and we cannot believe it's going to even last 40 years or 100 years. It looks so frail. It looks powerless. It looks like it can't possibly do anything. Why would you ever want that? Because we see it with full of mistakes, full of injustice, full of strife, full of jealousy, and especially Corinth. I mean, if you want to pick a bad one, pick Corinth. Wow, they had lots of problems. Wow, they had things that didn't make sense, that didn't come together except in the cross of Christ. And for that one thing, they are powerful. Jesus could have made an army out of the people he healed. And what he made was servants and disciples. We don't need a great warrior who can take over the world. We need a disciple who can live by faith in God because that's what makes all the difference it's faith in a God who brings holy out of nothing and righteousness out of nothing who knew it can create out of nothing because we believe and we follow and without doubt he has an army it's us and we don't meet with weapons we meet to sing didn't Gabby do a good job today that's tremendous. I love it. It's so great. And we preach Christ crucified. A Savior who died for us. That we could lay down our lives as lives for God. And so we realize and recognize that Jesus died as the price for our sin. And we die to ourself. And we are buried in baptism as a way to connect to the cross. It's what Jesus said. Make disciples by baptizing them. I don't know if that's where you are today. If you're trying to put something different in your life and trying to win at life and trying to figure out a better way, but at least you showed up here this morning. And what you really need is the power of the cross. 
So I want to give you that chance to respond, to be connected with the cross of Christ this morning. If you haven't done that yet, boy, it's time to do that. Because he is the one that changes your life and lets you know how to really be alive. Would you come while we stand and sing?